see everybody out there in YouTube land. This is Jen and Christian's with me and today is a bit of a bittersweet video because we are going to be celebrating a life that sadly was taken a little too soon from us that people in the horror community I feel should be celebrating it and I think the best way to celebrate somebody's life who's passed is to do a video on probably one of their most prominent films. I of course am talking about Julian Sands and the movie we're going to be celebrating his life with is uh, Warlock. So if you guys want to hear our thoughts on Warlock and also a little bit about the man himself, stick around. So, uh, Julian Sands, a very illustrious actor. Illustrious British man, a uh, character actor of the highest caliber in a lot of garbage, <laughs> but fuck it, we love it anyway. And although he did a little bit campy and a little over the top, he he, he brought this class to him. Wh whether he was playing someone likable or deliciously evil, like the character we're going to be talking about in a minute, he just brought this really panache to the character, and he was likable. And pretty much from everyone that he'd worked with, they, none of them have anything bad to say about the guy. He was fiercely private, and sadly it was uh, his passion that actually ended his life a little too short. He was an avid hiker and mountaineer and sadly uh, he went missing and it was confirmed that, that his body was found. He's been missing for about five months hoping for the best but and sadly it didn't work out that way um, and I felt that this was a wonderful time plus the movie we're talking about today is one that I watch the fuck out of. Warlock 1989 Warlock is probably a masterpiece and, pro and I know that sounds silly but the movie watching it holds up up really well. Some of the special effects are a little janky yeah. for the time and the budget, but actually that just makes it more endearing. It, this is a movie that's very rough around the edges, but it adds to its its charm. Like this is a movie there's no film like quite like Warlock. Like it's a fantasy horror adventure black comedy. It's a lot of things, but it's also entirely all its own. Yes, and for me it has a huge nostalgia because they played this movie a lot when I was growing up. Coming the stars has foretold. He has waited 300 years for this moment. <laughs> They've got 48 hours to stop him. So appointed you, executioner. <laughs> now, the most devastating power on earth is Warlock. Rated R. And it was always a treat. It was a movie, even though I watched a, a lot of, I never got sick of. And it was, and, and Julian Sands definitely is a standout of this movie. But the whole cast is the phenomenal. whole cast. Richard E. Grant does a phenomenal job, along with Laurie Singer, who, while apparently was a nightmare on set, I actually really like her character in the movie. I think she's kind of unique for like horror affair. Like she's not necessarily a final girl since this isn't a slasher movie, but she's a very unique type of character. And I was I rewatching the movie in the first time viewing. I was like, I was, I was kind of like worried, like, oh, are we going to do like, and no, the movie actually does some surprising things. Like she go, has a slide arc, but we don't do a lot of the cliche usual stuff we do with the, you know, these types of characters. Sad, my only real issue with her is we do sort of kind of have a last minute forced in romance at the very last minute that really comes out of nowhere, in my opinion. See, I would disagree with you because one of the things I really liked as a kid is the romance because I could see them kind of, the, the, anyway. I like the fact that it, you're right, it isn't, like, I, I don't think it comes out of nowhere, but I think they, they're very quiet about it. It's not an in-your-face, which I think is more sweet, it's more sort sweeter. Of, it's sort of there and throughout the film, but it really doesn't feel na that natural to me. Like, I'm gonna, and I know some people might roll their eyes at this, and also just because it's me, but, like, I low-key, because that's something I want to talk about. We won't go too super heavy into it, but I want to talk about that this movie has some surprisingly interesting queer coding to it. Yes. But I very much read her as like a lesbian character to me from like her outfits to her whole personality and stuff like I very much read her as a lesbian character so the whole relate forced relationship really doesn't do a lot for me see you say forced I think it's a very sweet in fact it's one of my favorite aspects of the movie is this romance and I think it's very sweet but I do agree with you it is a very it's, it, they don't shove it in your face especially of the movies of it's that time very subtle yes it's very subtle and very sweet and also I think they have wonder the two actors absolutely have wonderful Kim 
chemistry, and I think that is, the whole cast has wonderful chemistry. Uh, Sands has wonderful chemistry for, with Grant and Singer as well, and they all really blend really well. And if you think about it, the plot of this movie, I mean, it should be something if you roll your eyes or at least couldn't stand up as well as it does in the now time, yet this movie, uh, re-watching it, it still holds up. Okay, there are some places that we'll talk about that just from a modern Man. lens are just kind of ridiculous. Man, 9-11 really <laughs> changed the world. But this movie really, like, like the plot is silly. We we are we are opening up on two witches, base, well, a witch and a witch hunter basically get forwarded to the night, to the modern day era, and you would think it would be very goofy and over the top, but for the most part, well, well, they do sprinkle in a lot of fun humor, but I like that again. And to this movie, the subtlety is as weird as that sounds to talk about this kind of movie. Subtlety really is what is great about this movie. Even it, in its comedy, it's, it's cute, but it's subtle. It's, surprising. it's not leaning it in. It surprises you with certain uh, certain elements. It does. Like you could have really leaned into the whole fish out of water element with both Sands as well as uh, Grant, but and that element's definitely there. Naturally, they're characters who are from the 1800s that got transplanted. In the, into the 1990s. Of course, there's going to be some adjusting, but I like how it's pretty much tr played pretty chill and low-key. A little bit more with Grant than it is Sans. Sans just kind of has like one thing of like, oh, it's a quite a few decades later. <laughs> um, but that's about it. Always he's like, okay, fuck it, we ball. Um, but he's evil. I think evil doesn't take that. They take things a lot more chill than yeah, the rest of us. Whereas Grant does have a little bit more of like, what the fuck is going on? What is that plain giant bird thing in the sky? Like, like you definitely have those things, but you don't do it nearly as much as you would think with this type of premise of man from the past to, uh, brought to the modern day. Like, you really, th th you really don't get as many of the tropes. And I think it's a credit to the story because it doesn't kill bog down the pace. This movie is a nice brisk hour 40 minutes and I'm glad we don't have a lot of that stuff to kind of bog down the runtime. Um, one of my favorite scenes in this movie is where Julia Sands when he's in the present where he's talking to this unbaptized little boy and stuff and he's like I'm a witch. Witches can't enter a church. It's hollowed ground. <laughs> you're telling me you're a witch? You ain't no witch. Witches are girls. Some are men. Yeah? So where's your broomstick? Witches fly on broomsticks. Didn't you never see the Wizard of Oz? I need no broomstick to fly. Yeah? So what do you need? <laughs> That's one thing I really like about the movie. It adds in a lot of this little fun folklore, like the fact that you need the fat of a ch of an unbaptized child in order to create a flight potion. I like the fact. I like the fact. I learned. I learned it from that in this movie before *The Witch*, even. Um, but I like the fact that it actually gets a lot of folklore and stuff correct but originally yeah which was not a gendered term it was just a referred to like practicers of the dark odds and whatnot um it wasn't a gendered term until the 60s or 70s i can't remember which but around that time period uh when misogyny got involved and a bunch of people were like ah which sounds girly i i, I want to be like awesome and masculine it's too it's not it's not masculine enough for me and they're like okay fine warlock it's got war in the title it's killer um <laughs> I you know I, and I like that you brought that up because I didn't know that about that either. But I just like, you know, the, the, I like how Julian Sands, I just love it, the, to, to talk about his performance. I just, and it's nothing over the top, nothing heavy, nothing, nothing, nothing hammy. It's just him. Some of them are men. And it's that slight inflection like, oh my God, I'm so tired of having well, this. It, it's really cute. It comes off because it's the thing that brought him onto the picture because originally he wasn't that interested because he saw the title and was like, oh, this is probably a fucking slasher movie or something. It's guess given the fact that Steve Miner at that point was just coming off doing Friday 2 and 3. Yeah. Um, but when he actually read the script and found him, oh, there's like a delightfully ghoulish little sense of humor in this. I like th I like that. That's what got him onto the movie, actually, was the sense of humor. Yes, and Julius Sands, whenever he's de de uh, delivering kind of a cheeky line to Richard Grant, and I love the way these two play off of each other. You get that they're nemesis. From the very beginning of the movie, when, they're first, uh, when we get the first shots with them together in it, they're 
very, they're, they're just nemesis, and they're, you know, these two are just hunting each other, and it's a cat and mouse game, um, but I like the way Julian Sands delivers these kind of like, they're terrified of me, and how Richard E. Grant kind of just looks at him very non-blonze, because they're, they have him tied up in a tower, and again, it, it, it works as, a, like, this is, I don't know how factual this is, but in a little kid's mind, this is totally how the Yee Pass oh, yeah. work. It's like, this ain't no crucible, <laughs> but like, it totally like, goes with that like, kind of little kid logic, like you said, but in a very delightful and charming way, and not like, in an insufferable kind of way, like some movies come off that try to do the whole little kid logic. This just feels like, right for this type of story. Like, it's totally a type of movie where like, and it's appropriate, because that's something I'll say at the end, like, I totally recommend, like, this is totally a good, like, gateway horror movie for younger horror yes. fans, because there's not really any blood or gore in it. There's not really that much death. They're all, like, only two people, technically three, but only two people really, okay, and a kid. Okay, a couple <laughs> people die in this movie. And a kid. A kid, but, like, the kid's off screen, and, like, you, so, like, it's a pretty tame, pulled-back horror movie for the most part, so this is actually a really good gateway movie to get kids into horror, in my opinion. I would agree with that, but but even though there, it's a fairly bloodless, you know, for a horror movie, it's definitely not, like, a slasher Especially thing. Especially for the time. There are some cool effects that if you hit them at the right age, you know, you gotta get them young. You first get it's free, and then they're hooked for life, right, guys? Um, they, I I think if you hit him at the right age, the scene with the eyeballs, I think some kids are going to be, even now, maybe maybe not kids, but back in my day, kids were like, that's a really cool fucking scene. Yeah. And um, I also like when Satan finally comes through through the fake psychic. That was really cool looking. Now, some of the special effects don't hold up for a modern lens, but some of them surprisingly And do. some of them don't hold up due to nature of this movie's uh, production and issues. Um, like I said, Lori Singer was kind Kind of a nightmare on set apparently. I did not know she was that. incredibly difficult to work with and a, she was a nightmare specifically for the effects department. Um, so the whole thing about her in this movie is she has a hex put on her to make her slowly age 20 years every single day. So there were these elaborate makeup effects and prosthetics that they were going to do throughout the course of the movie. You might notice if you watch the movie, those aren't there. Not because they weren't supposed to. They were all done and ready to go. I always thought it was a Budget no, thing. they were all done and ready to go. It was it was gonna be great. And she was game for it until the first day on set where she was like, I'm not doing that. So they had to quickly rush up this kind of lot more downplay, just makeup job and some camera tricks and shadow and stuff to kind of make her look a little more aged. But that's partly why, like, yeah, I can look past a little bit more. Not not knowing it, I was like, oh man, that effect, <laughs> that effect you and me both said, like, that effect looks fucking awful. Even as a kid, um, I always just assumed because it was a lower budget movie, they that, didn't, couldn't do it. This movie had a $15 million budget. Like, I, this actually had a pretty substantial budget to it. Like, it, wa it they wanted to do this very elaborate, nice looking effect, but she was very against it suddenly for no reason. I mean, you can understand, no woman wants to look old. But she signed <laughs> on for it. Like, she was True. totally full with it, so it was it's kind of a dick move of her, so like all they could do is like, oh no, she's 40 now. Her eyes are slightly puffy. <laughs> ah! Well, like, I know what that's I mean, like. That's yeah. a nightmare. Yeah, but like it's it 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 it, 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 it did kind of backhand that effect particularly but like the rest of the effects for this movie they're very cheesy they're very but they but they work really well for this type of movie like this if is they not, do this is not trying to be like super highbrow cinema uh, no. um, even though the actors are treating at that it that way I think that's what really works is Julian Sands and Richard E. Grant are treating these roles very seriously they're not like doing very winky tongue and uh, tongue and cheek cat or like kind of roles like Julian Sands could have easily done like a Billy Zane and Demon Knight style performance performance with this role, but he doesn't. He treats it with a very sophisticated, suave, kind of sexy feel to it. Like, yes. Warlock got fucking mad drip. The outfit looks great, and Julian Sands looks fucking hot as hell in this role. Like, he works great. He does, and Richard E. Grant isn't bad on the eyes either. like a more, like, fucking Highlander, like, yeah. kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to kind of segue, because, like, hopefully by the time when this video is coming out, it's still Pride Month and stuff, and we didn't get to do as much as we wanted to, but I do want to talk about this, because even if it was a Pride Month, I would still be talking about this. Yes. This movie has an interesting fucking feel to it if you read it through a queer lens. Like, it's not at all text. It's downright stay in the movie. Her roommate is a gay man. Yes. Um, played fairly uh, for the time. But it's, uh, it's not the worst. <laughs> it's not like the most homophobic. It's not like he's going around like with a fucking crop top and a fucking booty shorts going, Oh no, what's on? 
girlfriend? You know, it could have been that. Not to say that there aren't gay men like that, but... The and there's nothing wrong with that. And not at all. We, we love our fucking, like, twinky femme queens. But, like, this... Th that was kind of, like, the perturbed... Like, Armand in, like, the birdcage kind of thing. Like, that is a prime example of how most gay characters around this time were treated. You, so it's kind of not that bad, actually. You're right. Um, I have to kiss this movie and slap it at the same time from my perspective on this because for the time, remember this was 1989 kids, for the time, yes, in some ways this, the, or the, the roommate, and he's not that big of a character, very small. But, but it's still, but he still manages to leave an impact. He does play, the, they do kind of, I don't even think it's him playing the part, I think that's how it was written. He was written somewhat stereotypically, but on the same hand, the, the, where I do have to slap it here, but I also have to kiss it because there's a line, and I did, again, this is something a dumb little Jen didn't see back in the day, but when I was watching it, I caught the line and I thought, for the time and the place, that's pretty progressive because because Lori Singer is telling the cops and stuff and, and they go, well, you said he was gay. And he goes, yeah, gay, not queer. And that might sound kind of like a slander but, now, but for the time she was saying, you know, he, was a, he, he just happened to be some, gay. Something you have to remember. Queer is a reclaimed slur. Uh, queer it, it, in this context was used as a slur, uh, mostly used as like a, as a dog whistle for yeah, and that's um, what they say. And that's what they insinuate in the movie. But that was very much like queer was originally like not originally originally, but during this time period was kind of a dog whistle code word for that type of thing. And it was it's a, become a reclaimed slur now in a modern lens. Um, but like at the time, yeah, that's absolutely like it. it it's a, it, again like you said, the character's questionable at certain points. At for but for the time, it's pretty good. It's actually fairly progressive. It was because I like what she said. She goes, you, you, yeah, he was gay, but he wasn't, you know, Char Charlie the molester kind of, you know, he just happened to be gay. He, he, mm -hmm. There wasn't anything bad about him. She delivers the line a lot better, but which, that's basically what it's implied. Which really isn't a lot nowadays, but during 1989, this time, 1989, guys. height of the AIDS epidemic, Reagan had just barely acknowledged that AIDS was even a thing. Um, he played can play a complete blind eye to it for the entirety of his presidency. So, like, the fact to see, like, in a, not, in, and it not made up, like, in a big deal, just kind of like, here's a queer character. Yeah, they're the first person to die, but we're still going to treat them like they're an actual person and not just going to make them, like, the fucking cook in sleepaway camp or something. Exactly. And another thing I really like is even, again, he, we don't focus too much, but they do give him a little bit of backstory, and you can see that this guy has a really good heart because basically, you, and they don't go into the backstory, but, you know, he tells Lori, she goes, you can't just drag in every stray you meet, and he looks at her and goes, I did with you. And yeah. you can see that he has a little bit of an exchange with Julian Sands and you can see he's a very warm open person and stuff and you know what she a little too trusting perhaps like, and it just it also just adds like, <laughs> and it's sweet like, and it's, that's not the only like element like again yes. Lori reads very queer to me she reads as a very le very lesbian to me um the fact that it's set in San Francisco she's a, she's roommates with a gay man hell like this is totally like it's not intended at all but like again you could even kind of look at it like oh she's a woman but she constantly has to inject herself of insulin and it, as a yeah. part of her daily routine. That could very easily be, like, replace insulin with estrogen. Like, absolutely, that's an easy reading you could do. Like, I, I, I plus even you get a little bit of that with, like, mostly Warlock. Not really Redford, but you no. can get that a little bit with Warlock, You too. do get that a little bit because, even, and there, again, we'll get a kiss, slap it and kiss it because how he kind of kills uh, our, our, our the, the gay guy is he kisses him. I mean, he, he makes out his and then rips out his tongue. Yeah, and um, it's it, it could be considered kind of homoerotic or yeah. just erotic if you're a pervert like me, hello. Yeah. Um, but it's it's very good and and again, there's not much gore scenes in this, but the but it's a cool scene and he also takes off a finger. Yeah, it's a very uh, it's a very fun scene overall. Like again, it's definitely reaching way for none of this was intended. Tech sans the stuff with the roommate itself, but like there's a it, that's what I love talking about like um horror or certain films of this era and finding little surprise things about this because it's stuff. 
one like this or like Butcher Baker where like there are these little outliers that weren't rash uh, irrationally homophobic. They're hard to find, but not every movie was Ace Ventura. Yes, yes, and I think for the time this was kind of ahead of... I also got it again, shout, and this doesn't have anything to do with the queer element, but one thing I do love that I got a shout out about Jillian Sands is he's kind of a little klepto because he sees the, the ring on the one roommate's finger he's and he evil. just he just wants it and he covet, covets it. That's a good word. Yeah. And he also covets the bracelet that Laurie Singer has. He's that, like a fucking crow that he's just... He's like a little klepto. A klepto a, crow. He's just like a little crow that sees a shiny <laughs> object and just steals it. I want it. it. I want yeah. it. But again, just what we just watched it tonight and it holds up surprisingly well. Okay, now there is one part that okay, you guys can we probably... Can we talk about the airport? That was just going to I that. love... And it'll be more appropriate since you, like, I grew up... I was born in 2001, so, like, I was a baby when 9-11 happened. But So I, for the most part, grew up in a post-9-11 world. You did, and you grew up with this movie and all that. So, like, oh my god, I have... Like, it's so fun. It is the most dated and aged thing about this movie. But I love the airport sequence, because it's literally, like, there's literally a scene of her going, Hey, you got a knife on you? Here, let me help you smuggle that through fucking thing so we can get it on a plane. I'm just like, oh my god! <laughs> you were having a blast it's when that... It's so scene. fun! And it and it's so... And, and it's both fun, and looking at it through a now lens, but it just as the movie, it's fun, because Richard E. Grant is really having fun with that. And I like how it sort of... He just literally stops in his tracks and looks out and says, you know, anyone who, do, who even dares dream of flying is considered a witch. And there's a great part when he's on the plane and she's like, I know there's a witch on here. I can feel it with my last breath. And she's like, well, maybe there's a good witch like Glenda in the Wizard of Oz, a good witch. And he's tapping his foot. And again, it's really whimsical it, it, and cute. It's really, it's really damn fun. But it's just, it's also just like, my god, imagine seeing this as a TSA officer now. A, a man in a fucking fur pelt, built like a brick shit house, walks up to the plane carrying a fucking iron weather vane spear with blood on it, and he just and you just hey, fucking, hands it to the and he just hands it to the stewardess, and she's just like, how can I how can I take that from you? And it is also quintessentially 80s because at the end we have the big graveyard fight scene between Julianne Sands and uh, Richard Grant, and it's just awesome, but it's also also very well it harkens back to the time of when I was growing up because you almost in these kind of movies because it is a horror but it also you could classify this as somewhat well, of an action I would thriller fantasy, yeah, it's I, a little I, bit of everything there's a reason why this tape is back here I describe this movie as if Willow was a little bit more of a horror film like it's a fantasy adventure comedy but also way more tinged into horror it's like the dark older sibling of hor of Willow to me it's like the goth of the yeah it's the, it's, <laughs> it's Willow's older goth a gothy sibling Basically, it is, but it uh, but it does have the tropes of the '80s and and just growing. I don't know if you can. And I'm not being a condescending. Well, cat, I but I'm saying it. that. Like, well, not to your level, probably, but I do appreciate. That I think I, I figured you did, but like growing, but growing up, it just kind of brings back a nostalgia. I'm like, they don't make movies like this anymore, and it's it's very nostalgic. And this movie is kind of a it's a comfort movie. It's a fun movie. Oh, it's God, a movie man. that you want to turn off your brain. Like really, like not to go on my thing, but like. Dude, this movie gets made today. It's just a bunch of quippy shit. Chris Pratt would probably be like the Richard E. Grant role or something like that. Like, oh god. Don't give Hollywood I'm, ideas. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna shut my mouth now, but like, you know that's exactly what it fucking would be too. It'd be really quippy and stuff and you would have a focus a lot more on like the man out of time thing. Yeah, uh, the, 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 they just don't make these movies like this and it, it, it's weird to see that a movie, because like I said, if you talk about the synopsis of this movie, by all rights it should fail. It, it, it should have failed back then, especially, but especially now in a modern day lens. And yet, because of the performances, because and I like the fact that the story is it, 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 it's focused, but it's not so structured. It's it, it has a looseness to it. Like, okay, we're aware what kind of movie we are. We're gonna put in our A game on some things, but we're also gonna have fun. We're not gonna take this too seriously. Yet everybody brings their A game, and yeah, it's, it plays it with the kind of absolutely. Like, no, this role could not have worked if it was like it could have. 
But like Julian Sands was the perfect choice for this type of role. And that, there was a lot, there was not a short list. There was actually a massive list of actors that were considered for this role. Uh, just a couple. Ian McKellen, Sir Patrick Stewart, um, fucking Willem Dafoe, which admittedly, that would have been fucking amazing, I think. Um, but I still think we got the yeah, right Christopher actor. Walken, which basically would have just made this another prophecy film. But yeah. I'm okay with it. Um, the list goes on and on. There was a bunch, I believe even like Patrick Swayze was uh, considered for the role. Like there was a lot of actors that were considered uh, for the role of the warlock, but Sans was the ultimate choice. And I think that was a correct one because he brings a lot to this role that I don't think anyone else would have. He does. And there is some other films in this series. And I've heard uh, there's three of them. And uh, he does he not does return for Armageddon. He does. And that is, guys, like uh, it's not a horrible film, but if you're going to watch it, the only reason to watch it is for Julianne's uh, Sands' performance. Yeah. Like this is a fun story, but he has other people to work on work with th this movie not so much and the story's a little weaker it, it might get its time like Loki I always kind of figured we would do war the warlock series as a companion piece with wishmaster as part of a November retrospective one year but due to re due to the recent passings we kind of wanted to expedite so we may someday give warlock Armageddon and three I guess um their time in the spotlight but that'll be a while but you Getting really only need to see the first film if you really like it, maybe part two, you can skip part three altogether. I've heard people say time and time again, people who are big fans of the Warlock series say that they've never seen part three because Julian Sands does not return. And most people's answer to that, well, if the, the only Warlock is Julian Sands, there is no Warlock without Julian Sands. So, you know, that kind of tells, that kind of speaks to his level of character and acting. And he is what makes these movies. Like Richard E. Grant and Laurie Singer are great. They really add something to it. But Julian Sands is the one that shines. And I think there's a reason when we're talking about him this is a movie that people just throw when you're talking there he's made some other great he's movies he's a phenomenal actor but i feel like there's a reason why this is probably his signature role yes um yes i, I would say so I, I would absolutely say uh, say it is and it's it's uh, like it like yeah to some people like oh his signature role is from like this kind of b-grade like a fantasy horror film from the uh, from the late 80s but like this movie this movie in particular too even to a point has a big cult falling warlock yes. has a large quite a large fandom um so i can and he and he was never really ashamed of it he was never one of these he was never an actor who did a lot of like the con circuit and stuff but the few times he did any to any fan who got to meet him and talk with him about the movies he was always very gracious to them and was always very happy and warm uh to talk about the uh, the movies actually yes and that makes me even like him more because uh because he was a very pro from what i've read about him he was a very private person didn't like to didn't like to share too much of his private life with people but he was a, you could and he kind of comes across screen whether he was playing someone delightfully evil or if he was playing one of the good guys there was just something very warm about him and he just has this touch there there is this flair to Julianne Sands no matter what character he's playing there is this really fl the theatrical flair that you just don't see they just don't make actors like this anymore he basically. treated every role with like the same level of like respect and like a grandiosity um even if the role necessarily didn't really call for it or it wasn't that type of movie, he'll still treat them with like the same level of like Shakespearean quality and stuff. Like it, it was very cool. It was a very cool thing he did. I think that is why this movie is so special. You talk about this movie and I know I light up and I've seen other people light up Absolutely, too. absolutely. Like this movie is always a blast to, uh, to revisit. It had been a while. So yeah, no, absolutely. Strong positive for me. Warlock is a bona fide classic. Like I said earlier, Honestly, really good gateway horror. Like, show this movie, watch this movie for a family night or something. It's a really good example of that. Nothing super bad, but still gets them a little bit of a taste of what the horror genre is and stuff. And yeah, like, so fucking show this shit to your kids instead of like, fucking Harry Potter or something. Like, if they want to show, if you want to show them a little magical movie, show them this instead of fucking Harry Potter. Um, I really love this movie. I loved it as a kid, and I am, this is one of the few movies that, you know, sometimes re-watching a movie that I loved from a very younger age, you might, it just, sometimes they just don't hold up as well, even no matter how much you love them. This is one of the few movies from my childhood that I say, oh man, it holds up. In fact, there are things I've discovered re-watching it tonight that I even appreciate it more, and it makes me even more, uh, 
sad that we lost Julianne Sands. Gone too soon. May you rest in peace. And what? You should be so proud. Wherever you are, you should be so proud of what you left behind. Hell of a legacy to leave behind. It is a hell of a legacy. And if you guys have not seen, and I know we didn't go as deeply into the, but I feel like most of our audience. The plot is very loose for this movie to begin with. It would have been redundant. You know, this is movie, this movie about the vibes. This, This was a review, but it was also in memoriam. We really wanted to celebrate Julianne Sands. And it, like I said, it was, I was like, oh man, when I when I found out that, yeah, they found his body. I, I was I was bummed and it's like little piece of your childhood. There are certain actors like that just, you know, are part of your childhood. And when you hear them, they're gone. It, it, it's a little sad, even if you never knew him in real life. It's a little sad. And he was definitely one of those actors. So may he rest in peace. He does have a hell of a legacy to be proud of. And if you have, ne- I mean, again, I agree with everything Christian said. This is a movie that would be great to watch with kids, great to watch with friends. If it's been a while since you've seen it, I would throw this one on as a, you know, as a way to celebrate the, uh, a, a wonderful actor who we lost too soon. Oh, but oh, this is a fun movie, guys. Definitely, if you if you have kids that are right at the right age, watch it with your kids. Watch it as in celebration or just, and if you've never seen it, yeah, put this one onto your watch pile it's and watch readily it. readily available on the Tubi. Yes, it is. Just watch it because it, it, you're missing out on a great movie. And again, if it's been a while, oh my God, it's a treat. And I hope you guys are like me and have found things as you've gotten with older eyes to appreciate even more. I loved this movie as a kid, and I'm happy to say I think I love this movie even more now. Right on. Watching That's always it. a great experience. And that is the magic of movies. And it's also kind of cool, because this is like a time piece. This is like going back. If you didn't get to grow up in that era like I did, it's a wonderful window to see what it was like. It really was. Well, it, it may be not the most practical, but it's no. fun. It's it's a fun, it's a hell of a movie. And may you rest in peace, Julian Sands, wherever you are, because you should be very proud. And with all that out of the way, booze and ghouls, uh, we hope you've enjoyed this review slash memoria. As always, booze and ghouls, thank you so much for watching. And in the meantime, keep watching and talking horror, and hopefully we'll be back real soon. And again, may you rest in peace, Julian. Bye, guys.